good evening everybody those who are in india and a good morning to our friends in the west that is united states of america last three months image is doing the journal club and which has become very popular not only among the students of hematology oncology but also among the faculties as well all credit goes to our dynamic young secretary Colonel Uday. Today we have the honor of having Dr. Vincent Rajkumar as the international expert. He is alumni of CMC Valor, and he is presently working as consultant in Mayo Clinic, Rochester. Our Indian expert is Dr. Rina Nair from TMC, Kolkata. Both the experts are doyens in the field of multiple myeloma. They will be sharing their experience and their expertise on this. Today, the journal club will be presented by Dr. Akhay Lahoti. He is a consultant in TMC Kolkata. The topic today is endurance trial, which is a landmark trial. All of us will know this has been quoted very often among the academic discussions and webinars, etc. And this has given insight into the management of multiple myeloma, particularly the autologous stem cell transplant. So without further delay, I'll request Dr. Akhay to start the John Crow presentation. This will be followed by discussion, first by our Indian expert, followed by the international expert. Dr. Akhay, please. Thank you, sir. I'll be sharing my screen, sir. Yeah. Yeah, okay, go into this sli uh, slide show. Yes. Yeah, you are absolutely correct. Sir, I hope I am audible, sir. Yes, you are, sir. Okay, you are audible. Please go ahead. Sure, sir. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank Image Group for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I'll be discussing the endurance trial today in this journal club on behalf of Tata Medical Center, Kolkata. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. And uh, let's set up the background for this trial. So the initial therapy for multiple myeloma plays a critical role. That is the induction therapy for multiple myeloma plays a critical role in enabling rapid disease control, decreasing the risk of complication and early death, and determining the long-term outcomes. Improvements in the depth and duration of response as well as supportive care have significantly improved the survival for multiple myeloma in the recent years. And this has been possible because of the availability of multiple drugs to us. And this has caused remarkable progress in the last two decades from improving the overall survival from median of three years to eight to 10 years in the recent decade. So the three major group of drugs form the backbone for the management of multiple myeloma of which first is the immunomodulator agents. Among the immunomodulators, thalidomide has been available to us since long, but in between it was withdrawn because of its side effects. Further, it was reintroduced for the management of multiple myeloma and subsequently we found lenalidomide and pomalidomide available to us. Few retrospective trials have shown that lenalidomide is better than thalidomide. The second group of drug is the steroids. And for a long time we were using high dose steroids. And with that, we were facing a lot of troubles with the patients facing deep pain thrombosis, infections, including pneumonias and other side effects. And this trial suggested that low dose dexamethasone is associated with better short term overall survival and is associated with lower toxicity. Therefore, low dose steroids have been become the standard of care in this management. Third group is the proteasome inhibitors. Among the proteasome inhibitors, bortezomib is the most common proteasome inhibitor which has been used for the management of newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. But bortezomib is associated with its own 
problems, which I'll be discussing in the subsequent slides. Subsequently, we have carfilzomib and also ixazomib, which have been approved proteasome inhibitor and few more are into the clinical trials. Now, when these three drugs were combined, it was shown that the triple drug combination, which included bortezomib, lenalidomide and dexa versus Lendex was associated with improvement in the PFS and also overall survival without significant increase in the toxicity. Therefore, triple drug regimen that is VRD became the standard of care for treatment of newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. The IFM 2009 trial showed us that the triple drug combination that is RVD plus transplantation was associated with significantly improved longer PFS than RVD therapy alone. But overall survival did not differ significantly between the two approaches. But still, giving RVD therapy for a longer time was a problem as there are high rates of peripheral neuropathy which precludes its long-term administration. Importantly, PFS with VRD is typically shorter than 4 years and almost all patients eventually relapse. Therefore, clearly there is a need to improve on long-term outcomes of newly diagnosed multiple myelomas. So what did we have? We had carfilzomib. So carfilzomib is a second generation PI approved for the treatment of relapsed multiple myeloma which selectively and irreversibly binds to proteasome and is 1.5 to 2 times more potent than bortezomib, which has been shown in the preclinical trials. In phase 2 trials in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, carfilzomib Lendex has shown high overall response rate and deep durable responses suggesting that KRD may provide superior outcomes to VRD. And that has been the motive behind this study. So based on the results and efficacy in relapsed multiple myeloma, KRD was being increasingly adapted into clinical practice for initial therapy for NDML without a phase 3 trial demonstrating improved efficacy over VRD. So the goal of this investigative initiated phase 3 trial was to determine if KRD is superior to VRD in the treatment of newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients. When we see Indian perspective, so again, 26% of the transplant eligible patients, this is not the complete cohort, but it is amongst the eligible patients who are diagnosed with multiple myeloma undergo upfront STT in India. So for majority of our patients, chemotherapy is the only treatment available. VRD, which is the most commonly regimen used for first line treatment of NDMM. So we also wanted whether KRD can give deeper responses and better PFS over VRD in first line setting. And this trial has evaluated that thing in depth. And therefore, this trial holds great value for Indian myeloma patients too. So let's come on to the endurance trial. And this trial was conducted in accordance and collaboration with US cooperative groups. And we are privileged and fortunate to have Professor Shahji Kumar sir and Vincent Rajkumar sir, who are the lead authors of this paper to be available with us today when we are discussing this trial. This is a randomized open phase, open label phase three trial. Patients were enrolled from 272 sites between November 2013 and January 2019. Patients were equally allocated to receive induction therapy with VRD or KRD. Patients completing induction phase were randomized a second time with equal allocation to indefinite versus two years of lenalidomide maintenance. But we will be discussing the first part of the randomization, that is the induction therapy. And the, the results of the second randomization are still awaited. And <clears throat> the purpose of today's general club is to emphasize whether VRD or KRD, which one is better as a part of induction trial. So we'll stuck, stick to the first randomization today. All the patients provided written informed consent. All others reviewed and approved the manuscript. Which patients were included? So all newly diagnosed multiple myeloma who were 18 years and older, who were considered ineligible to undergo ASCT or not intending to proceed to immediate stem cell transplant with measurable or evaluable disease in any form, ECOG performance of 0 to 2, adequate marrow reserve and with creatinine clearance more than 30 ml per minute. The patients who were excluded were the high risk multiple myeloma patients who have been defined as defined by one of the following. That is if the translocation 1416, 1420 or deletion 17P was present on fish, if the serum LDH was more than two times upper limit of normal, 
if there were more than 20% circulating plasma cells or 2000 plasma cells on peripheral blood smear, or if the high risk GEP signature by gene expression was tested, were not enrolled. Also, the patients with peripheral neuropathy grade two or higher, evidence of congestive heart failure and MI within the previous six months were excluded. <clears throat> so this was the therapy which was given after randomization and the patients were given bortezomib Lendex, which is the same what we usually give to our patients. And it was a three-week cycle for a total of 12 weeks, 12 cycles. And for the carfilzomib Lendex, the carfilzomib dose was around 20 mg per meter square for cycle one. And then it was increased to 36 mg per meter square from cycle two onwards. And this was a four weekly cycle for a total of nine cycles. The second randomization done for, was for the lenalidomide maintenance for which we will not be discussing today. <clears throat> Disease assessment was done after every cycle during induction with serum or urine protein electrophoresis, every third cycle during maintenance. Bone marrow was done after week 12 and week 36. Quality of life assessment was performed at four time points during induction and follow-up for response and follow-up for survival was done as stated. For the outcome analysis, primary endpoint which was included is the PFS for the induction phase of the trial that is KRD versus VRD. Secondary endpoints which were included were overall response rates, time to progression, duration of response, overall survival, and minimal residual disease, negative rate for which was measured by flow cytometry. <clears throat> so this was a two-stage randomized study. And it was hypothesized that with the KRD, probably we'll get a four-year PFS versus VRD, which gives a median PFS of three years. So initial enrollment was planned was around 756. But given a lower than anticipated number of patients proceeding to the second randomization, the study was revised with an enrollment of 1080 patients. So with 1080 patients randomized at induction and five years of follow-up, there was 80% power at a one-sided 0.025 significance level to detect a 25% reduction in the hazard rate. Kaplan-Meier method was used to estimate survival. The log rank test, stratified Cox proportional hazards, and Wilcoxon test were used for the statistical analysis. <clears throat> Let's see the results of this trial. So around 1087 patients were enrolled and they were randomly assigned to induction therapy with VRD or KRD and were included in the intention to treat population. Assigned treatment was started around, in around 97% of the cohort and were included in the response accessible and safety populations. So looking at the consort, patients with newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, standard risk and intermediate risk were uh, included in the trial of which 1087 patients were randomized to the VRD and KRDM equally of which after 62 and 74 ineligible patients, around 939 patients were eligible and treated. The important thing to uh, look over here is in the VRD arm, that is around 228 of 527 patients, that is around 43% patients could complete treatment as defined by the protocol. So there were many patients who could not tolerate and for most of them, the therapy had to be withheld or the dose had to be reduced. The majority of the uh, problem which occurred were disease progression, adverse events, and the uh, patients opted for the alternative treatment because of the side effects with the VRD. And in the KRD, around 62% could complete treatment as defined by the protocol. That is, each and every dose was taken in the defined time. Around 73 patients died in the VRD arm and around 75 died in the KRD arm. When we look at the baseline characteristics, so median age of the patients was around 64 and 65. And when analyzing the clinical parameters as well as biochemical parameters, they were quite comparable between the two arms. PFS of the two arms was almost overlapping, was, is almost overlapping over each other. Median PFS with the KRD arm is around 34.6 months and the VRD arm is 34.4 months which is almost same. And again, for the overall survival, the curves are overlapping over each other. Even doing the subgroup analysis did not reveal any difference in any of the subgroup favoring KRD or VRD. 
for the induction best overall response rate stringent cr was seen in around 6% patients in the qrd and around 4% in the vrd complete responses were seen in around 12% and around 11% in the vrd yeah, which is quite similar but when we see the vgpr and more response rates so it was statistically significant for the krd yeah, there were 74% patients versus 65% patients in the vrd yeah. Even when we look at the MRD negative rate, although they were more in the KRDM, but it was not significant. So VGPR and more rates were more with the KRD as compared to VRD. Grade three to five non-hematological adverse events. So the percentage was almost similar. It was 42% for the VRD and it was 48% for the KRD. But when we see the composite cardiac, pulmonary and renal toxicities, they were <clears throat> quite significantly more in the KRDM as compared to VRD. So carfilzomib had more of cardiac, pulmonary and renal side effects, which was around 16% of the patients had those and versus 5% in the VRDM. Peripheral sensory and motor neuropathy was seen more in the VRD as compared to KRDM. For the toxicity, dose reduction and discontinuation of therapy was seen more with the bortezomib as compared to carfilzomib. Grade 3 to 5 serious adverse events were reported more in carfilzomib arm. Again, mortality that was treatment related and even non-related was more seen with the carfilzomib as compared to bortezomib arm. There was some decreased quality of life neurotoxicity score in the VRD arm, as seen in this. The rest, other uh, quality of life measures were almost equally balanced between the two. Coming on to discussion. So this trial directly compares two three drug combinations with the goal of informing clinical practice. Results from the current trial performed largely in community-based oncology practices provide a better assessment of the real-world efficacy of these regimens. KRD is not superior to VRD for initial treatment of newly diagnosed multiple myeloma standard or intermediate risk patients who are ineligible for ASCT or did not intend to have early ASCT. Overall response rates were comparable between these regimens. Although VGPR rates were better with KRD, but this did not translate into PFS benefit. This could likely reflect the impact of toxicity related to the therapy, which may have led to delays in the treatment and dose modifications, compromising the overall efficacy because the grade 3 to 5 adverse events, serious adverse events, and the mortality was more with carfilzomib. Therefore, we could not find any overall efficacy with this. One might have anticipated a longer PFS for VRD in the current trial with the exclusion of high-risk patients, but the patients in the current trial were older, partly explaining this finding. Quality of life compliance rate by the end of induction was 97% and no difference was observed between the arms in terms of physical or functional well-being scores. Some decrease was noted in the neurotoxicity scores in the VRD arm. When we compare this study with the previous study of bortezomib versus carfilzomib, so in the Andover trial which was done for the relapsed refractory patients, the carfilzomib was shown superior in terms of PFS over bortezomib. Although in this trial, the dose of carfilzomib was more as compared to the dose what we have used in this trial. When this study has been compared with Clarion trial, the, the results are almost comparable in the newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients. So both the drugs are showing the equal efficacy as well as the side effects. Now this is interesting to see when KRD was given as a regimen in phase two trials, the CR rates were around 70, 61 to 78%. In this study, which is a phase 3 trial, the CR rates are around 18%. Even the stringent CR rates were more as compared to this study, quite more. The PFS rate is almost half as shown in the phase 2 studies done before. Probably these phase 2 trials are done in more selected group of patients. And in this trial, which was performed largely in community-based oncology practices, it provides a better assessment of the real-world efficacy of these regimens. So to conclude, given the efficacy, safety, convenience, and cost, VRD remains the standard of care for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients <clears throat> considered for treatment with a PI-emit-based triplet 
as well as the backbone to build quadruplet regimen. We should wait for randomized trial results before moving new drugs into clinical practice based on data from single arm studies. Even while comparing the cost, even when we are using generic drugs in Indian population, the cost of KRD is almost four times more as compared to VRD. And it is very important to consider this aspect because these patients do require long-term therapy. And most of them are not affording in our population. I would like to highlight few strengths of this trial. Study results have major implications for our clinical practice. And VRD is well tolerated, outpatient regimen with manageable toxicity for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. This trial establishes VRD as a standard arm for subsequent clinical research as new drugs are approved for newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients. Equal efficacy of the two regimens provides evidence for KRD being an option for induction in patients presenting with neuropathy or not tolerating bortezomib. Limitations as per the author are that they did not exclude translocation for protein translocation, which is an adverse prognostic marker in myeloma, although they have included the other high-risk parameters. It does not address the role of KRD as a pre-transplant induction therapy, which was not the goal or aim of this trial. The overall discontinuation rate was relatively high in this study. And this we all see in our clinical practice too. With this, I would like to acknowledge Image for introducing this platform and giving us this opportunity. Dr. Vincent sir and Dr. Shaji sir for, uh, for this trial. And Dr. Reena Nair, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity to present this at this platform. I would like to thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Akhay. Thank you very much. And Dr. Reena Nair, as uh, the uh, national expert, madam, if you can just start discussion on this. Okay, so I think Akshay has kind of done everything. I don't have really too much to say. But he has actually shown us the evolution of therapy. And we know that from SWOG, which showed a you know, reasonably good PF and OS benefit for VRD, that became the standard of care. But the recent phase two trials were very impressive. And when you start seeing stringent CRs of 40 to 60% translating into excellent PFS, then there is a kind of an itch in practice that we want to use the newest drug upfront rather than keep it you know, for trials to prove something and use them later. And then we do give many justifications quite easily to say this is a young patient, there is a high risk of the disease coming back or this is a high risk patient and we want to give the best treatment upfront and et cetera, et cetera. So many reasons to bring any drug quickly into the front line. So this trial is actually very important to our practice. The majority of our patients, like we have some data available now from India, which shows that patients who are transplant eligible, about 20 to 25% of them actually undergo transplants. Most of it is for reasons of cost and availability of transplant centers. This is an investigator initiate trial. And so unlike drug trials, and unlike trials which are done in you know, academic centers, which have a lot of expertise, this is more of a community oncology practice. And so it helps us to take decisions for our patients across the country as well. And of course, it provides an assessment to the real world efficacy of the regimen. Uh, when we look at the trial, then there is nothing to choose between the old and the young patients. Both of them had the same outcome. So we can't even say that we can utilize this upfront in the younger patient. It also validates the findings of the Clarion trial, which means now we have two large randomized trials. And that is good evidence to say that we should not be in a hurry to bring carfilzomib up front. It can be used later as and when it is required. And so the conclusions like Akshay just showed us are quite simple. This is easy to handle in the OPD. It remains the most effective therapy. It is convenient to our patients. And of course, it is cost effective, as we just saw. Uh, it also provides the research backbone for all the other trials with new drugs, which are likely to come up in the near future. But the most important lesson I think that we have learned time and again is wait for an RCT when we bring up new drugs into the upfront practice of our patients. 
So I just had one or two comments to make uh, about this uh, trial and the trials in past. And I will, you know, kind of be happy if the experts give us some more information on this. We, you know, if it is MRD, which is high or low between uh, trials, it is something that you can understand because that is still not so well validated. And as the tools become more and more sensitive, we may be picking up higher MRDs in some trials and it may be lower in some, or we may call them easily MRD negative. But when it comes to stringent CR, it has been available for us for so long and it is so well defined that to understand why we got only 10% stringent CR with KRD over here, whereas the phase two trials show anywhere between 40 to 60 percent is something which is a little difficult uh, understanding that those were phase two and this is a community-based phase three trial with all its pragmatic approach to patient management. The other thing of course which uh, Akshay has highlighted well is despite the dose reduction and the dose discontinuation the toxicity, which was grade three to five for VRD and the mortality, both treatment related and during induction from other cause, perhaps offset the uh, better outcomes that one may have wanted from the KRD regimen. And so again, I think we need to kind of think about indolent incurable diseases, whether we really go very aggressive and end up having you know, patients lost to treatment or go gently in their disease, especially in a disease where the median age at presentation is anywhere between 65 to 70 years. And so uh, I think uh, needless to say that we can conclude KRD remains the standard of care for now. So um, Vincent, I will leave the discussion to you next. And then maybe we just have a few I have a few questions on the methodology, which maybe we can take after you have made your comments. Um, I, I uh, Good evening. So uh, I think uh, Dr. Vincent uh, has some issues. So he is has not joined. So he may be joining at any time. Um, uh, with your permission, ma'am, uh, I can, you know, make a couple of uh, comments. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So one of the thing, you know, is that this trial is done in patients who were standard risk and intermediate risk and not the high risk. So when we are comparing uh, carfilzomib with bortezomib in combination with dexamethasone and linalidomide, so we are talking of standard risk patients and not high risk. So although, you know, 414 was included uh, uh, as uh, uh, one of the parameter, but, uh, uh, you know, but really no high risk patients were there. So when we compare botizomib and carfilzomib, so we say that in the standard risk setting, there is no difference when you use upfront. The second question was uh, about the phase two trial showing better CR, stringent CR and MRD uh, rates as compared to when we are doing it in a randomized fashion. So one of the things uh, which happens is when we are comparing the different trials is that at what point of time we have uh, looked at the remission rates and MRD negative rates. So let's say the previous standard was, uh, you know, doing all these investigations at three months. But in this trial, uh, you know, it was done at four months. And we know, you know, as we go on, uh, you know, giving the therapies and uh, more and more patients, uh, you know, achieve stringent CR and MRD negative rates. So I'm postulating, I'm, I mean, it is, uh, I, I really do not know, but I'm postulating that probably in the phase two trials, they have looked at the best stringent CR rates and MRD negative rates, which may have happened at six months or eight months or 10 months of therapy rather than, you know, at three months or four months of therapy, which was seen in, in this patient. So that is, uh, you know, hypothesis. Uh, um, so uh, these were some of the some of the comments and maybe, you know, other people, uh, Hari and uh, Uday and Joseph and uh, Dr. Saikia, I see, and, and Dr. Sadashiv do, they can chip in for more comments. 
Uh, sir, if you permit, can I uh, give few comments on this? Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah, so uh, there were few uh, startling aspects as far as this study was concerned. First thing is, they compared a three-weekly VRD versus, which, is, which was given for 12 cycles, versus four-weekly KRD for nine cycles. First question which comes to my mind is, are they really comparable if we are comparing a three-weekly regimen for more number of cycles versus four weekly regimen for only less number of cycles. So that's aspect number one. The aspect number two, which needs to be considered is as already brought out by both Reena ma'am and Pankaj sir. Uh, though they have excluded most of the high risk patients, they did include some 414 patients. And when they actually did a sub analysis of uh, evaluating those patients with 414, they found out that actually there was no difference between the two regimens. And what uh, the authors, they commented uh, as replies to few letters to editor was actually perhaps giving any proteasome inhibitor might actually benefit and what type of proteasome inhibitor might be immaterial as far as the uh, treatment in 414 patients is concerned. The third thing is regarding the toxicity profile. If we look at the number of patients who actually completed the, th uh, the study or completed the treatment as assigned as far as the uh, study protocol was concerned, it was 61.6% in KRD versus 43% 43% in VRD. So this shows that that uh, the discontinuations because of carfilzomib were only 9.9% when compared to 17.3% assigned to bortezomib. And they label this high rates of discontinuation to bortezomib secondary to peripheral neuropathy. And whereas the discontinuations were quite low in KRD because of the lack of this peripheral neuropathy which was there. So considering these things, despite the KRD patients had some cardiac, pulmonary and renal adverse effects, but the percentage was much lower and the discontinuation rates were much lower. So maybe with the generic uh, uh, carfilzomib available in our country and with uh, low rates of discontinuation and at par, I would not say superior, but at par PFS with lower number of cycles and with cycles which are spaced long enough, uh, far enough. So maybe... KRD might be actually beneficial in our scenarios, uh, considering the cost as an important uh, component of our decision making, clinical decision making. I think Dr. Hari wants to uh, give his comment. Really. So, one of the things that I uh, felt about what, why would proteasome uh, uh, inhibition? be differential in the rel relapsed refractory setting as it would be in the upfront setting. So it was just uh, a thought uh, that when probably you don't need so much of, in the newly diagnosed myeloma patient, you don't need so much of proteasome inhibition, uh, reversible or irreversible to gain control over the disease as you might have a requirement in a relapsed refractory setting. This is a thought that came through when you have such a stark difference in uh, the responses, uh, which is a, wherein carfilzomib is a clear winner uh, in the relapsed uh, refractory setting uh, as against um, you know, as against in the primary treatment of uh, multiple myeloma. So this is something that is like a hypothesis, but I'm not sure whether uh, that is true, but I'm open to uh, any sort of comments from the experts on this. The other thing is, you know, in practice, uh, I don't know if y'all can give the entire 25 milligrams of lenalidomide to all the yeah. patients for so long. Yeah. I find it extremely hard. And uh, with myeloma, I find that the longer you can give treatment, even if it is lesser treatment and you are doing those reductions, at least they complete their treatments and they go on to receiving the 10 milligrams lenalidomide as maintenance quite effectively. If you're very strict with the doses upfront, you end up with complications and then you have to stop therapy and wait for the toxicities or you tend to you know, not give the adequate amount of therapy. So uh, in a similar manner, maybe it is the continuous therapy that goes on, which actually gives the benefit to these patients rather than being very dose intensive and ending up with a lot of toxicity. 
uh, madam here i agree to you in indian patients uh, quite a lot large number nearly 50% they don't tolerate that 25 mg of lenalidomide and uh, many a times you have to decrease second thing is in this particular study we have got only two protagonism inhibitors that uh, that is botizumab and uh, carfilzomib one has to be kept in such patients for a lab setting so i think seeing the cost and other things in Indi indian scenario i think botizumab remains the choice one and uh, see also the toxicity profile in our day to day use in relapse refractory patient where we use carfilzomib it's not a, such a easy drug as botizumab to be tolerated many of them will have cyclopenia many of them will cardiac toxicity so i think this should be kept as a second drug unlike in us you have got a third drug which is uh, available there exuma but we don't have i think in our setting still vrd remains the choice of induction therapy so what pankaj was saying actually is something that we need to wait for the uh, newer trials where they have used carfilzomib up front in patients with high risk myelomas and those were excluded from this trial particularly because that was running in parallel and i think once those trials are complete we may have i mean carfilzomib is not all over and gone out from the front line it may come in in patients with high risk myelomas for certain but i think at the moment for standard risk uh, and intermediate risk uh, vrd does seem to win over uh, having something that is a little more difficult to give little more toxic and considering we are dealing with patients who are older the cardiac and the pulmonary events do worry us when we are treating these patients with carfilzomib is uh, dr vincent rajkumar joined uday can you confirm it no sir not yet i think he must be busy with uh, he must have got stuck with something So we have got some uh, quick audience questions. If you can take them, yeah, Doctor yeah. Reena, Doctor Hari, and Doctor Pankaj. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, should I go ahead and ask those questions? I yes, sir. Please, 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 sir. Please, sir. Okay. I just see the chat. One question from just to ask. I think. from uh, dr sumit mirk that baseline it is for those who have got renal dysfunction at baseline is crd is better or beneficial over vrd uh, yeah dr rina or dr uh, pankaj one of you can answer this dr akshay can answer this okay <laughs> ready go ahead yeah So, actually, you're ready, ma'am. You please go ahead. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, give it so, a okay, try. You can answer this. You can answer this, okay? By the trial, you can tell us where they actually did those changes for patients who had creatinine clearance of less than sixty mm -hmm. um, versus mm -hmm. those who had more than sixty. And of course, they did not use this. treatment in patients who had creatinine clearance of less than 30 so for less than 30 creatinine clearance they were excluded but for more than 30 to 60 they used lenalidomide of 10 mg and for more than 60 creatinine clearance they had used the full dose of lenalidomide but for the proteasome inhibitors they found that bortezomib was less toxic as compared when renal toxicity was considered so carfilzomib were more renal toxic as compared to bortezomib <clears throat> so the dose adjustment was done for lenalidomide in patients who came with renal dysfunction and once the creatinine clearance actually went up beyond 60 once the disease was controlled they increased the lenalidomide in those patients also to 25 mg uh, so akshay one more question for you if carfilzomib was used once weekly in crd regime or the toxicity rate as toxicity rates have been lesser than reported this so is this again from to comment because <clears throat> the trial used twice weekly regimen that was 3 weeks on and 1 week off but if it was used once weekly which has been shown by few people that 70 mg per meter square can be used once a week 
as in this trial they had used 36 mg per meter square for two days subsequently but uh, probably yes if we if we talk about those trials but they were for a smaller number of patients in which 70 mg per meter square was shown to be equal efficacious with less renal toxicity okay thank you okay one more question again the carfil carfil jomi uh, dose why this uh, investigator they use 36 mg per meter square this particular dose given the fact that higher dose already have been used so this trial was started long before it was before 2030 they started recruiting the patients so at that time this dose clarity was not there so this was the ideal dose they must have used this is just what i can infer from this trial i think thank you okay thank you very much uh, thanks dr rena thanks uh, uh, dr pankaj and dr hari for their valuable now i'll hand over a valuable comment and i will hand over to uday for taking up the next session thank you sir uday please thank you thank you sir thank you everyone for uh, their comments i'll quickly go to the next part of it um, so as every month we have the eagle eye competition for those who are new entrants for this particular meeting were not part of the previous meeting a quick know how of what was this uh, eagle eye competition all about so Uh, a recently published article on a plasma cell dyscrasia will be selected by the international faculty. You are supposed to write one seventy five words and send it to us by the due date, which is generally a week before your actual uh, general scan or a general club. And anybody can participate, whether it is a JR, SR faculty. And in fact, the first two times the prize winners are the first time was a internal medicine assistant professor, and second time a practicing physician from railways, Indian railways. so you can understand the outreach of this program and the people who are interested in participating and writing the commentaries so anybody can participate the best commentary uh, will be selected by the blinded reviewers they do it very very technically and they are absolutely uh, meticulous about selecting the things and we give different prizes for the same the purpose was we want everyone to read about the latest articles as far as the plasma cell dyscrasia was concerned we want them to learn the habit of critical appraisal they should refine the art of uh, scanning the articles and writing letter to editors and most of you should then take it further and present or uh, write this as actual letters to editors to the journals because whatever article we are actually selecting they are within that period of uh, writing letters to editors also we want you to get an opportunity to present in front of the international audience in a time limit of 5 minutes how you can quickly wrap up an article and present the crux of it so lastly this is the inter institutional competition various institutes are learning this now this is how we analyze this time and uh, the person who got the highest is entry number 4 and the first prize winner for this uh, month is dr sumit mir from uh, tmh mumbai currently though he is at varanasi sitting at varanasi but he is the one who won it so i'll be uh, not wasting much time and i'll be uh, handing over to my ideas to play the gel scan Good evening. Today's topic is a recent paper from Blood that lenalidomide promotes the development of TPF3 mutated therapy-related myeloid neoplasms. So we know that therapy-related myeloid neoplasms, which arise from prior chemoradiotherapies, have a dismal prognosis, whether it is because of the therapies inducing mutations themselves or selection of pre-existing mutant stem cells and the cytotoxic stress is unknown. To address the issues, whether specific treatments promote the outgrowth of specific mutant clones or whether treatment modifications can decrease the risk the study was conducted single center analysis from md anderson over the last 12 years comprising 416 patients and it also compared 1021 patients with dnovo myeloid neoplasms for 60% patients had an 81 gene panel and subsequently an extensive 300 gene panel now len acts on cerebellum which is the primary target which degrades the substrates icaros and ilos which are responsible for the b cell transcription factors and it degrades in via proteasome pathway it also degrades ck1 alpha because of which there is subsequent triggering of a p53 dependent apoptosis now because mds 5q deletion patients have only one ck1 alpha that is why they are more sensitive to lenalidoma in murine models emids are not active because isoleucine on cerebellum at position 391 causes steric interest for substrate recruitment 
If we replace that with the line, it makes them sensitive to immunomodulated drugs. That is why I391V is an emid sensitive murine model. So stem cells from emid sensitive mice as well as the wild type mice were immortalized, modified to carry clonal hematopoiesis mutations and subsequently treated with the emids. And cell viability was assessed for drug sensitivity. Lower the viability means higher the drug sensitivity and vice versa. Similarly, mice were transplanted with emid sensitive stem cells and TP3 mutations or CK1 alpha heterozygous mutations or TET2 mutations or none of them treated with immunomodulated drugs and subsequently yeah. analyzed. Qualitative and quantitative data were assessed by standard methods and multivariate logistic regression was used to overcome the confounding factors. It comes to results. The median age of the cohort was 68 years with solid tumors comprising 63% of the cohort. Chemotherapy either alone or in combination comprising 85% of the prior risk. Prior autotransplant in 17% as expected, complex karyotype and chromosome 5 7 abnormalities were common abnormalities, and 17 pedilations seen in 13% patients. Mutations were seen in 85%, and the most common ones were TP53 and TPM1D. When it comes to TP53, the more common ones were biallelic, either two mutations or one mutation plus one deletion as a common scenario. When we look at the association between gene mutations and prior exposures, TP3 was commonly associated with thalidomide analog therapy and interestingly negatively correlated with topoisoverase 2 inhibitor therapy. Similarly, PP1D was associated with platinum analog therapy and EZH2 mutation with venkalkaloid therapy. When we look at a percentage of viable cells on the Y axis in comparison to the drug concentration on the X axis, the TP3 mutated cell line did not budge with lenalidomide in contrast to all other cell lines which are sensitive to lenalidomide. In contrast, formalidomide affected all the cell lines, including TP53. When mice irradiated were transplanted with emid sensitive stem cells, which were modified by virtue of these six mutations, along with the two control genes in variable proportions, and subsequently they were treated with lenalidomide after engraftment, they saw that in the peripheral blood, the TP53 mutated stem cells rose. Similarly, in the bone marrow, in all the compartments, the TP3 mutated stem cell population increased with lenalidomide and not with pomalidomide, thereby selecting, giving us that there is a selective advantage to TP3 mutated stem cells with lenalidomide. Similarly, why does this happen? Whether it is because CK1 alpha, they proved this by transplanting irradiated mice with CK1 alpha heterozygous population and subsequently treating them with emits or the control vehicle that is DMSO. And they saw that only LEN caused a selective depletion of CK1 alpha population in the peripheral blood as well as in the bone marrow in contrast to the other emits, thereby telling us that LEN toxicity is enhanced by haploid insufficiency for CK1A1. So this has told us that there is a proof of concept that LEN promotes selective advantage of the TP3 mutated stem cells and others don't. What is the absolute risk? Is there a relevance of dose dependence? We don't know. Prior auto transplantations were poorly represented in this cohort and that was only 17%. I end with a food for thought whether it is prime time for finite maintenance in myeloma. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. That was a wonderful uh, gen scan. Thanks, Dr. Sumit, for nicely wrapping up the uh, complete aspects about the lenalidomide and the way like like it asked and everything and uh, covering the article. Now, I would request Dr. Sanjeev to take it further and uh, have the quiz, please. Dr. Sanjeev. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Journal Club Journal Scan. Uh, Dr. By Sanjeev, the... you are not audible. I'm not audible? Okay. Yeah, I think, sorry, there was some problem from myself. Okay, please go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Good evening, everyone. After the journal club journal scan, uh, moving to the myeloma quiz. Next slide. Uh, as per uh, previous quiz, there will be five questions, two on journal club, two on journal scan, and one on trivia. The fastest finger uh, with correct answer gets an uh, attractive prize and a certificate. Uh, so are you ready? We can start with the quiz. Uh, this is about the endurance trial. And we know that uh, in endurance trial, we uh, compare 
the BRT versus KRD in a newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients, you have to uh, tell which of the following is not true regarding the endurance trial. The options are the KRD improves progression-free survival compared with the VRD in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma, a significant higher rate of cardiopulmonary and renal toxicity was observed with KRD, a neuropathy rates were higher with VRD, and the last option is VRD remains the standard triple induction regimen in standard and intermediate risk newly diagnosed multiple myeloma and a uh, suitable backbone for four drug combination. Your time starts. Coming to the second question. This is regarding the Ikemia study which is a randomized open-label multicentric uh, study assessing the cl clinical benefits of isatuximab combined with uh, uh, carfilzomib and dexamethasone versus the carfilzomib and dexamethasone in patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma previously treated with uh, uh, at least three prior lines of treatment. The options are the most patients in uh, isatuximab, uh, carfilzomib, dexamethasone versus carfilzomib, dexa reaches MRD negative status. At least twice reached complete remission with MRD negative status. Option C is the MRD negative with isatuximab, carfilzomib, dexamethasone can be reached independently of bad prognostic uh, markers such as renal impairment, ISS stage 3 or more than 3 prior lines of therapy and in patients with gain 1Q. Option D is reaching MRD status, negative status was not associated with uh, longer PFS in isatuximab, carfilzomib, dexamethasone arm. Your time starts now. Coming to the question number three. A new class of drug called tri-specific antibodies is opening up in myeloma care with a new announcement by the Ischion Sciences. The tri-specific antibody targets two areas found in the multiple myeloma cells, that is BCMA and CD38, and joins that with the CD3 T cells. The company's uh, prosperity platform is called BEAT. The main uh, limitation of the study is the risk of side effect is keratopathy. This is the major limitation of the study. Option B is the presence of CD28 also increase the ability of T cells to kill different type of myeloma cells even at a lowest dose level. The CD38 protein on the surface of myeloma cells provides a mechanism for the uh, tri-specific antibody to latch onto the myeloma cells. And the option D is the CD3 protein is part of the T-cell receptor which recognizes abnormal cell by binding molecule called antigens. Your time starts now. Coming to the question number four. A drug used in treatment of relapsed refractory multiple myeloma is in the process of being pulled off the US market by its manufacturer. The drug is Belentamap and uh, it, uh, its uh, trade name is Blendrep, an antibody drug conjugate that targets B cell maturation antigen BCMA. You have to tell what is the reason for its withdrawal. Answer is options are high rates of CRS, B, 
keratopathy c high incidence of more than uh, grade 3 grade 4 non hematological adherence adverse side effect and uh, option d is high rate of progressive disease have to tell the reason for its withdrawal your time starts now Coming to last question of the quiz, what is the color of cancer ribbon for multiple myeloma? Your options are lilac, black, burgundy, green. Your time starts now. With that, uh, it is the end of quiz. And uh, we can discuss the uh, questions. Meanwhile, the result will be available. Next slide, please. Uh, there is a question, why multiple myeloma trials are named after constellation? I will need comment after uh, I explain the answers. Next question. The first question was the endurance trial. Uh, which of the following is not true regarding the endurance trial? The answer is KRD improves progression-free survival compared with the VRD in newly diagnosed multiple myeloma. Uh, doc Dr. Akshay has clearly uh, presented in the article in the journal club that uh, KRD doesn't improve the uh, PFS as compared to VRD. There is no uh, PFS or OS benefit when we compare head-to-head -head KRD or VRD. And rest of the option are true. With KRD, there are more cardiopulmonary and renal toxicity. And with VRD, there is more neuropathy. And definitely VRD is the standard triplet uh, induction regimen in low risk and intermediate risk uh, newly diagnosed multiple myeloma because high risk patients were excluded in the trial. Next question. Uh, this is the uh, Dr. Shadi Kumar sir has uh, conducted this trial uh, in Mayo Clinic. Next, next slide. And this is the uh, OS and PFS curves. We can clearly see they are almost same. Next slide. In the IKEMA study, uh, the isatuximab and carfilzomib dexamethasone versus carfilzomib dexamethasone, uh, the uh, reaching MRD negative status was not associated with longer PFS in isatuximab carfilzomib dexa arm. So it doesn't give any benefit in progression free survival. There is benefit in achieving MRD negative status. There is benefit in achieving uh, CR status, more CR with uh, isatuximab, carfilzomib, dexa combination versus carfilzomib, dexa. But there is no progression free uh, survival benefit with isatuximab, carfilzomib, dexa arm. Almost uh, similar results. Next question. Can we move to next question? Uh, this is the published uh, uh, study, the depth of response and response kinetics of isatuximab plus carfilzomib and dexamethasone in mul uh, relapsed multiple myeloma. It's pub it is published in blood advances. You can go through it. Next slide. And this is the crux of the study. Next slide. The third uh, uh, question was about the tri-specific antibodies or uh, in short, we called it treat, uh, like bites, it's treat. So the major limitation for this study was CRS, not the keratopathy. 
so this is the correct answer option a is the correct answer the main limitation of this study is uh, cytokine release syndrome rather than keratopathy next question uh, this is the published uh, paper in nature and uh, isb2001 this is the first tri specific antibody uh, going to be available after uh, study next question this is about the drug uh, blend rap which is uh, uh, belantamab mefodotin and it is a antibody drug conjugate and uh, we have asked about reason for its withdrawal and uh, the re reason for withdrawal is keratopathy because it causes ocular toxicity in almost 80% of the cases in all the studies published uh, that is the dream studies dream 1 dream 2 and there is a high uh, risk of keratopathy due to the uh, toxin attached with the antibody that toxin causes ocular toxicity that's why uh th this drug is about to withdraw from the us markets next question this is about a publication about the ocular toxicity of blentamab and uh, there are many papers regarding it and uh, next uh, next uh, question this is the what is the color of uh, cancer river for multiple myeloma this is the burgundy color and uh, march is the myeloma awareness month with the march 30 as myeloma action day so this is the a trivia you have to know about everything about myeloma thank you dr sanjeev you have to answer why the myeloma trials are named beyond constellations so that i was extensively to answer that Uh, no, I I was extensively searching about it. I did not find the answer. Okay, nor I think any one of us know about it. We should ask the next whenever we have the international faculty with us. Why do why are they so malab astrologically inclined? So anyway, thanks a lot, Doctor Sanjeev, for a wonderful and quiz. And this endurance is a endurance is a satellite uh, which is uh, uh, launched by the NASA. Oh wow, that's a real trivia. thank you thank you dr yes. sanjeev for uh, taking us through such a nice and interesting quiz so um, can i share my slides please yes sir okay so next month fourth thursday again we'll all catch up that would be on 22nd of december and this time uh, it will be from my own home ground where in afmc would be presenting the next general club 5:30 pm onwards so don't miss that now these are few statistics we just pulled out so these are the total number of registrants that we had for the last three general clubs and total number of the quiz participants in the first and the second general club the first general club was presented by pgi chandigarh second was by tata memorial hospital mumbai attract actually uh, in the correct sense and third one by uh, tmc kolkata the winner of the first eagle eye was dr harikrishnan a uh, internist uh, second one is dr nazneen a internist and third one is dr sumit mehr a faculty in uh, a uh, hemato oncology who is currently practicing at uh, homi baba cancer institute at varanasi next we have the winners of the quiz as dr pankaj patel for the first time and for the second time dr tintu from madras medical college and this time we have dr malini from homi baba cancer hospital the last two times the best uh, marking was 3 out of 5 but this time she has broken the record she has got 5 out of 5 all five correct congratulations dr malini for uh, spotting all the answers right now my job does not finish without uh, saying a few words of uh, gratitude towards out of the four uh, entries because all the four entries were really well written the quality of the commentary was really great 
and it was wonderful to read through those commentaries and the same opinions are echoed also by the chair of this particular subcommittee that is Dr. Joseph John who has gone through these uh, comments. I would like to thank the trio of uh, the scientific uh, oblique newsletter subcommittee that is Dr. Uh, Brigadier Satyaranjan Das, Dr. Joseph John and Dr. Hari Menon for taking this every month uh, on themselves and uh, uh, spearheading this particular activity without any uh, hindrances. I also would like to thank other uh, executive committee members of uh, the Indian Myeloma Academic Group and in particular, uh, Dr. Pankaj Malhotra, our president. Our special thanks to Dr. Shaji and Dr. Vincent. Somehow because of that, some technical glitches that we had today, they couldn't join us because they didn't get the uh, login details in time. But actually, they were heavily involved into the whole general club discussion because we already had two or three discussions as a prelude to the current discussion about the endurance and why and what and everything of that. So hopefully next time you'll be seeing them uh, on board. And uh, thanks to both of you, sirs. So I would end here and I would like to thank everyone and request all of you to kindly uh, join us uh, again next month, uh, four weeks from now. Uh, the fourth Thursday, that is 22nd of December. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. So I would like to close it by handing it over once again to Dr. Das, sir, um, for any final comments and closing the session, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, that It was very nice, though we missed uh, Dr. Saji and Dr. Vincent, but uh, it was very nice. All like Dr. Pankaj, Dr. Rina, all contributed so nicely. Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating. Uh, bye.